Okay, <laughs> now we're all set up. So uh, we're very sad that Marielva can't be here with us today. So Maria Fernanda and I are going to read some of the things that Marielva wanted to share with you today. So at uh, the beginning of our panel, we wanted to talk a little bit about Venezuela while democracy was still in place and uh, the wealth of Venezuela in the 1960s and the 70s. So Marielva would have said, in the 60s and 70s, Venezuela was the wealthiest country in South America and one of the richest countries in the world because of the expansion of the oil industry. But Venezuela could never find a solution to poverty. Even when the country had large resources and income, we also had a large population who continued to be poor. This meant that although we, there were very important social achievements throughout the 20th century, such a massive access to education, the improvement of basic services, construction of infrastructure, among other things, there continued to be social inequality that incubated the social, political, and economic crisis that afflicted the country today. With that setup of a country during the 70s, um, with history in music, um, and just one orchestra, the, the Venezuela Symphony Orchestra, uh, and Maestro Jose Antonio Abreu dreamed about a project making music with young people. And in 1975, he created this dream with 11 musicians creating an orchestra that later um, was called the, the Simon Bolivar Symphony Orchestra, but that was the seat for El Sistema. And at the same time that politically and socially the country was going down for the last four years, El Sistema was rising and being known around the world by, by the quality of its musicians. So many of us are part of that product in El Sistema. I myself started very young in one of the nucleus. And although at that time, I never thought the music as a profession, nowadays when I analyze, it was the opportunity that El Sistema gave me to have knowledge about the music, to be engaged in something bigger than me, to be part of a society, to, to have friends making music, and now El Sistema has been expanded, not just from Venezuela, but copied in different countries. So El Sistema Inspire is now a model copying different countries and adapted for those countries. But in a certain way, we kept tied by that idea to make music, to bring joy through music. And right now, with the situation that we have in Venezuela, many orchestras are being dismantled by the people who left Venezuela. But the idea, the primary idea of El Sistema is still in the hearts of the young people in Venezuela who go there just to make music, to forget the social crisis that we are living right now in the country. Your experience about this. <laughs> yeah, um, of course, uh, I, I was a student, uh, I started my, my in music through one of the nucleus. Um, I, uh, I started very young and then as I advanced, at that point in the, in the, in the, in the prehistory when I was younger, <laughs> the system was not super developed that it, as is it now. I mean, it was very developed, but it's still in the, in the uh, in the states of, of, that were farther from the capital, it was not as developed. So I, I needed to, after I was more advanced and I didn't have anybody to teach me at my hometown, I needed to uh, travel to Caracas every, every two weeks 
I talk about a boss that taught me in the best case 12 hours to get there and 12 hours back uh, for a lesson. So I kept doing that for five years. Uh, then I moved to France, to Europe, and I continued studies there. But one of the core ideas of El Sistema is to receive and then give back. The way you, you know, people say, you know, El Sistema is free, it's free. Well, you know, I don't know. There are different transactions. <laughs> I mean, it's not everything is about money. I, and I think that at El Sistema, we learned that the transaction is to receive and then return in the shape of what you received, which is education. So I had that at, at, my, at the core of my values, and that's why I, I decided to go back to Venezuela to give back what I had received. And I went back to Venezuela in, after my studies in Europe, and, and I, I, I teamed with my very dear friend here, Simon, a lot of time ago, and we formed a, a branch of the Latin American Academies, the so-called Latin American Academies, at, at the Andean states, the states of the Andes. Uh, we were both directors of that, and we multiplied the students there. I don't know how, like, a thousand percent or more. While we were there, our idea was to give back what we received and so that they didn't have to travel 25 hours to get a lesson for a one hour lesson. So we did that for a few years, but then things got complicated and, and uh, I always also, on the other hand, felt the pull of, of coming to the United States and, and experiencing the culture here. So I, I took advantage of the fact that I had some savings and things and, and, and applied to colleges, and that's when I came to study at the University of Michigan. Uh, so I'm here in this, sitting here in this chair, thank, thanks to this institution. Uh, and then uh, my, my original idea was to go back, but unfortunately, it, that didn't happen because things got worse and worse. And, but you know, I, I still, I founded, uh, launched a program here inspired by El Sistema in my time here at Mitchell's Elementary School here in Ann Arbor. And, um, and, and I, I still, I am still in contact with the students from Venezuela. We all do everything that we can to help them there's one student here in Ann Arbor right now that I, I have helped a lot, Adalus Low, who is a very talented cellist. Uh, and I, I plan to do that for, if I was lucky, just to share that love with others. And because that's, that's what was, that was the most valuable idea that El Sistema taught me is that there are transactions that are not about money and uh, more about love. And, and generosity. Thank you for sharing that, uh, Horacio. And that is the story of many, many of the students in El Sistema. They learn how to teach, being taught by their professor, but they become monitors for the youngest, youngest generations. And that's part of the academy or El Sistema of teaching there. How is the, the the process in El Sistema for pianists. Ana Maria, talk to us about that, please. Um, there is none, <laughs> basically. <laughs> uh, since you know, piano in a symphony orchestra generally has a small role, um, they don't train pianists. So my experience with El Sistema was only in periphery because I played with people that were part of El Sistema. I played chamber music. So yeah, my, my journey is very different. And one of the things I liked about this idea of the panel is I think through the journeys of each one of us, uh, you can see different aspects of Venezuelan crisis and economy and um, history. So in, in my case, um, I was looking for opportunities. So I left when the Chavez regime was still pretty early on. It was 2003. 
So you could still, you could already see that things were going to go south at some point, but Venezuela was still pretty much okay at that time. I was simply looking for opportunities as a musician. I think in Latin America, when we reach a certain point and you're serious about music, you try to go to the States or try to go to Europe for further education. Um, and I was, I was very lucky. One of the, the main points I would like to make with this panel is I think a lot of times um, American faculty members are not aware of how difficult things are for international students here, especially when those students come from poor countries or from Latin America because they get very little support from their, from their families. And I think that's the case for you know, Horacio, Regulo, Maria, and me. When we came here, we were basically on our, on our own. I mean, you were, you were younger when you came, and, it, and Reynaldo will tell you about his story. Uh, but um, it is complicated, and um, I was just very lucky that I had a professor that liked my playing, and she helped me get an assistantship here. But when you're outside of the system, you have no idea how the educational system works, how expensive university is here. And if you have no guidance, it is extremely difficult for a young student from South America to come study here. So I think all of us we're lucky that we found people along our ways that helped us and told us how to navigate those things. And once we were here, people that helped us make a living. And I think, um, as Horacio was saying, uh, we all have a big commitment to try to help very talented students in Latin America to come study here. And not only tell them, okay, come study with me, but also guide them through the process. And once they're here, help them find jobs so they can make a living. Because even if you have an assistantship, a lot of times that's not enough. To, if you don't have any support from your family. So um, I was very lucky, as Horacio said, I owe so much to the University of Michigan for all the support that I got here financially and from my mentors and all the things that I learned really changed me as a person, as a musician. Um, it was truly a pivotal moment in my career and um, it created many of the opportunities that later on would um, help me get to where I am. Um, and for that, I'm extremely grateful. Um, another situation that all of us go through is uh, with our families and our parents. Um, most of these guys' parents are still in Venezuela, and as and Reynaldo was saying, uh, it's always very concerning knowing that your family is there, and they might not have water, they might not have electricity, they might not find any food. I used to send food to my mother in boxes. Um, and I used to send her money, and then finally I convinced her. I think things got so bad that one day she said, I, she fell actually, and um, couldn't get up for like three hours and nobody came to help her. And I think that was the, the thing that shook her. And I'm very grateful that I was able to bring her here. And um, we found ourselves in a position of having to help our parents now, which is not ideal, but we all do it happily. Um, and it's part of, of this, crisis that has bled into our lives in that regard. Uh, but all of us have found such great opportunities here in this country uh, to keep growing as musicians, as educators. Um, and for that, we're very grateful. And we wanted to continue um, talking about current situation in Venezuela and challenges for musicians. And here I quote again words from Marielba. It would be very complex to try to explain the causes of the Venezuelan situation, which has been described as a complex humanitarian emergency. However, it is possible to say that it is not due to a natural catastrophe, nor due to war, but rather has its roots in the destruction of democracy. I think a review of the data would be helpful in understanding the magnitude of the problem. Since 2015, more than six million of 30 million Venezuelans have had to emigrate, which constitute the largest migratory movement in the history of Latin America and the second largest migration of a global scale after Syria. This migration has been forced by the worsening of the public services crisis, the lack of access to drinking water, electricity, and transportation, because in the most critical moments, there has not been even gasoline, something paradoxical in, a, in an oil country. The health system has been dismantled, which has meant the reappearance of epidemics such as malaria, measles, and diphtheria, which decades ago were under control. According to the National Survey of Living Conditions carried out by university researchers, 
to feel the lack of access to official information. More than 94% of Venezuelan households are in poverty, and more than 76% in extreme poverty. Figures from the United Nations indicate that in recent years, a third of the population has suffered from malnutrition. Although a long uh, hyperinflationary period of 49 months recently ended, economic conditions remain critical for most. The minimum wage is approximately 10 bolivares a month, about $2. Venezuela, which had a predominantly young population, was preparing to enjoy demographic bonus but with massive migration, especially of young people, that opportunity was lost. We have lost an entire new generation in many areas, including scientists, professionals, technicians, and artists. Recovery looks difficult because 1.2 million children and adolescents have dropped out of the educational system in the last three years. Journalism has been one of the activities punished by the advance of authoritarianism. The media have been persecuted in various ways, including financial suffocation, the lack of access to paper to print in the case of newspapers, the revocation of concessions in the case of radio or television, or the blocking of the internet in the case of digital media. And now I wanted to pass the microphone to Simon, talking a little bit about your experience. Thank you. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. I would like to share a few words regarding I would like to give you a picture about two, two situations and maybe two Venezuelas. The first time that I left Venezuela, I was 11 years old. It was in 1991. And um, my family, uh, my dad my, and my mom, they could um, certainly afford my education in Switzerland, being both of them professionals teaching in a important university in Maracaibo, which is the second city of Venezuela. That was in 1991. However, we already had a deep sickness regarding corruption, inflation, and it was maybe what we are going through now is certainly the end of a very, very, very uh, long list of wrong decisions. And um, I would like to get back to this 1991. Um, my parents decided to provide me the best education that they could. That's something that I think is very important for our culture. And uh, I went to Switzerland with one of their salaries, right? So I, I got part of my mom or my dad. <laughs> and I was in, in Switzerland. Of course, I was not like the other kids because it was still much less than other Swiss people. However, it was possible for me to get a beautiful musical training, and also I got support from our country. And our wish was to come back. As I think all of us, we left feeling that there is that transaction. And there is also that love that we have for our country, our culture. And that's something that maybe American people, I hope you will never get to have the feeling that you don't have any more home, that you don't feel safe in your own country. So I think that's important to have this kind of events because we need to create awareness regarding the protection of the system, of the democracy. And I think that's maybe the strongest message that I think I would like to share is that any country, in, in any context, we can make wrong decisions. We can actually, uh, Chavez was elected in a very democratic system with, it could be better maybe, but finally the democracy is something that we need to protect in many ways. And uh, I think I went back to Venezuela uh, in 2005 and uh, it was my dream to get back home to, to feel what a lot of wonderful musicians were living. At some point, Caracas was a very exciting town regarding music with wonderful musicians. Gabriela Montero, Gustavo Dudamel, uh, many, Alexis Cárdenas, very big name for us, and not only for us, international names that were in Caracas, almost in, on the same street. So it was 
five, six concerts a week with beautiful orchestras. It was extremely exciting to be in Caracas. However, every month was a little bit more complicated to pay my bills. And every month was more complicated, more complicated, more difficult. I got married, little baby, and suddenly I had to spend hours in a line to buy certain products that, of course, I was excited. I wanted to be a good dad. I, w I still won. <laughs> and we didn't see that little by little, we got humiliated. We started to perform for the government when we shouldn't. We started to have a certain, um, we, we created habits that shouldn't never happen in any country where music and culture start to serve the regime. And again, I think uh, I want to get back to, the, as, to my parent history. They were affording my education in Switzerland, and now they have $5 a month. So they were gaining about 5,000 in 1991, and now they are surviving with about $5 a month. Our tragedy is not only political, it's not only social, but it's mainly um, what we feel, what is happening, because that, the problem is not that they get $5. It is a big problem. But the problem is that there is still no hope to get better. And that's a very big problem for us, because I think to, to face the, the situation, to say, OK, we will support our parents, and we will do our best, and Venezuelan people will keep that very good sense of humor, <laughs> hopefully. But at the, at the same time, or in the meantime, there is no ways today to see our country change if we don't have a very important political change with the international support, with, of course, the movement coming from the country, and hopefully another generation trying to build a country with values that we have. And I think El Sistema has been part of um, a good example that is possible to, to build values and a great, great foundations to rebuild our society. Thank you. Before I, I talk quickly about what I was going to tell you, I'm, I'm just struck by a couple of the things that I want to just make sure that we actually like say out loud because I think it's a, it's a little bit of the subtext that folks have been kind of alluding to, and I think it's important to just put put a name to it. One is that we would not be here had it not been for music. And just how important, when we talk about music making a difference, it is not, it is not lies. It's not, a, it's not a fantasy. It's not overblown. It's not an exaggeration. We are living proof of that. None of us would be here being able to have the kinds of lives that we have had it not been for the gift of music that we were given. So if somebody tells you that music doesn't matter, send them to talk to me or to any of us, and we will set them straight. So that's the one thing. The other thing is just how important it is, and I think, Ana Maria, you, you alluded to this, just how important it is to, that all of us fell with, within the, the help, the reach of somebody here who was able to see the potential and support us and help us and just lend a help, helping hand. And if you are doing that work, we thank you from the bottom of your heart, and it does make a difference, and we would not be here without people on this side of things to have supported us in our journeys through here. We all found a mentor, a teacher, a family member, a friend who was able to at one point or another lend a helping hand, fill, filling out forms, getting scholarships, um, navigating the various systems. All of these things are so important. And it, it's such a difficult part of, of the transition. And so thank you to all of you who have in one way or another helped not just us, but anybody who's, who's coming here in, in this situation. I, I want to just briefly um, talk a little bit about my situation, which is a little bit different from my friends here, that I came, I, I came as a teenager. Um, and um, to me, the, like I mentioned a little bit earlier, that my relationship with, with my Venezuelan identity is, is very complicated, just because uh, I've now lived here for more than half of my life, and that's a that's a strange feeling. I, I don't know if, if you're an immigrant when you've spent more time in one place than the place that you call home, 
that feels strange. There is, there is, there is something that in your brain that kind of goes off. Uh, and like I mentioned before, the birth of my son was something that was to me a, a big trigger for, for, this, um, for these thoughts about my own identity because uh, I was struck by this, this very, very powerful and, and sad and tragic thought that I wanted to share who I am with my son. And I think that's every parent wants to share who they are with their children, right? And I realized that a big part of me I could not share with him, or my daughter now, I have a second, you know. And that um, how, how difficult it is for me to have to tell my children what, what Venezuela is like, and it's not there anymore. There is a place on the map, you could go to Google Maps, you will find Venezuela, but that the Venezuela that we grew up in does not exist anymore. And it is a country that we as Venezuelans have to keep alive in our minds, in our brains, and together. Um, and my work as a composer lately has been really focused on trying to keep this flame alive, trying to in some way create not a fictional country, it's a very real country that exists in our hearts. And I know that sounds cheesy, but it is not. Our country has been taken away from us. I cannot take my children to my country and show them, here's where I grew up, here is my teacher, here is that little stand where I used to get my, my ice cream on Sunday afternoons. This is where my dad took me to the movies. I can't share that. So it's all of these things are things that we have, that you have to dig into the deep recesses of your memory to try to keep it alive. And then you're hoping that through creating opportunities for my children to interact with other Venezuelans and my family, that we can somehow keep this Venezuelanness alive. And it is very difficult. The last thing I'll share about this is that um, there is a kind of a, a dual um, um, perspective on this. Like, on, on the one hand, there is the, 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 the deep and, and powerful tragedy of the six million Venezuelans that have left the, the country, but there is also the fact that now we have six million Venezuelans all over the world, and that, our, that the world will get to know who we are and our culture, and that we'll get to plant little roots, and my children will be a part of that, of that process, because they will grow up be in Venezuela in their own way, and they're gonna to have to figure out what that means in, on their own terms. And, um, so, but but there, there, there will always be a sadness in that. And the, 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 last, the last thing I'll, I'll, I'll say is just kind of having experienced the holidays recently, just kind of like Venezuelan holidays now are experienced through WhatsApp. Like every, there is no such thing as a family Christmas or family, birthday or anything, everything is, is mediated through screens because that is how the families have stayed together. And we're thankful that we at least have the technology to be able to do that, but it is now a part of what it means to be a Venezuelan and what it means to be a Venezuelan family. I have family in five countries. I'm in the United States, I have a brother in Canada, another brother in Spain, and my mom is in Colombia, and my dad is in Venezuela. And this is, this is just what being a Venezuelan means. You have people all over the world. And there is sadness and a deep wound that comes from that, but there's also a sense of, of beauty of, of the next generation, of what it means for our music and our culture and our food and our language to now be a, a little part of everywhere in the world. And at least we can try to look um, and find something positive to say about that. So thank you. And to wrap up, I wanted to focus on the positive part that Reynaldo just mentioned, and also on the idea of the transaction that we all feel that need, as Horacio said, of we were given education and mentoring and guidance, and that's what we feel uh, we were raised to also give back. And I wanted to talk a little bit about my story very, very briefly, and focus on something very special that we were able to create as Venezuelans that want to give back and be part of that generation that is um, part of raising awareness and letting people know of our culture. So I um, came here to the United States to study here at the University of Michigan. I did my undergraduate here. Um, and after that, I did my master's at the University of Miami and decided that I was missing my culture. So I went back to Mexico at that time. I got a job teaching in a conservatory there. 
lived there for three years, had a great time. And I remember one time there, I said, um, I'm going to do a recital of Latin American works only. This was around 2006. So I contacted my flute teacher and some composers I knew had written works for flute. And through email, I did not get back one answer. I was not able to find works. I was not able to do any of that. And I was wondering, how, how can I do this? Why don't we have a resource or a tool where we can find this information? Not only for us Venezuelans or Latin Americans that want to do this, but someone that is in a different place in the world. If they want to know this repertoire and this music, what can we do? <clears throat> So after three years living in Mexico, I realized of the richness that the musical world had in Venezuela. Uh, every time I would go on vacation, there was Simon Rattle or the Berlin Field or all of these incredible musicians in, in Caracas just teaching, being a part of El Sistema and learning and giving there. <clears throat> so I decided I shouldn't be in Mexico anymore. Let's go back to Venezuela. I was given a job to teach in El Sistema. Um, I was also teaching in a high school where I studied. And I went back hoping to just get an orchestra job and, and just create my own career. And it was so hard to be able to do this. I was fully teaching. I remember I had students that live in Carora and took a 10-hour uh, bus uh, ride to study with me for one hour. And um, I would teach from 8 in the morning on a Saturday to 6 p.m. with no lunch break because I would feel bad. I knew these students were taking this bus, so I, was, I, I would feel bad to do that. So it was a, a, a very beautiful time of growth and, and giving back and learning and being back in touch with my culture. I wanted to live and grow up and have my family in Venezuela. That's where I visualized myself. And after four years, I was finally able to get a job in an orchestra in the Orquesta Municipal de Caracas. And I was, this was a dream, just teaching life and orchestra life. And in the orchestra, I was able to perform a lot of the repertoire by Venezuelan composers and Latin American composers. And my experience with this, I was given this uh, sheet of music that was the copy of the copy of the copy of the manuscript. I could not read a note. I, for me, it was so hard to understand this. And I turned to the oboe player. And I'm like, can you read this? And of course, this is Carreño. Everybody knows the calligraphy. Everybody knows this. And I mean, everybody knows that this is the way that we read the music from Latin America or Venezuelan composers. And I felt bad. I'm like, OK, I need to learn how to <laughs> read this music. And I took my pencil and tried to help myself be able to read the notes. So after six years in Venezuela, trying to create a family, my husband is here, is regular. We were trying to just get our own apartment and grow, and we just couldn't do it. With three, work, three jobs, regular is also a lawyer. We did so much, and we just couldn't, couldn't make ends meet. So we decided to leave, and we came back to the United States, both of us, to study. Uh, and we're so grateful for education and academy because it allowed us to grow, to, to expand our minds, no matter what age we are or our experience. And we were able to end up here at the University of Michigan, where I did a specialist degree and a doctorate degree, regular did his master's and doctorate degree. And we couldn't be more fortunate to have arrived here and to have the incredible mentors we had, to have the ideas and the guidance that we had and being in this institution. And being here, we realized, well, how can we give back? How can we solve this problem? And then we started to think, how about doing editions of that music that we just couldn't read? At that time, we were performing Porgy and Bess with USO, the, the, edit, the reading of the critical edition with the Gershwin Initiative and Professor Mark Lake, and we were like, we should do that. That's what we need to do. So we started to get all of these ideas. And LAMI became, we created LAMI, the Latin American Music Initiative, an organization with the mission to change the anonymity of Latin American composers and the invisibility of their works. We divided LAMI in three branches. One that was focused is called ALMA, Spanish for Soul, focused on creating editions and publishing this music for everyone to find. The second branch is called um, uh, Ofrenda, present, uh, which is our production branch. We do concerts and recordings so people could hear this music. And Siembra, our educational branch, which is um, Spanish for to plant or to sow. And this is where we are giving uh, residencies and we have a, a Latin American music festival that we had virtually in July. And where we want to be able to do this, or not only just play the music, but understand the background and the context. And we really could not do that without the idea of transaction, giving back, taking some control over our lives, 
and especially with the help of allies, mentors that were there for us, uh, of institutions that are able to give grants like Excel, the Excel grant we want, different grants with them that were able to allow us to develop this. We are extremely thankful for all of you to be here, to the professors at the University of Michigan, to Pamela for putting this together and creating this space for us to talk a little bit about this and to share our music. To Professor Mark Lake, you have been our mentor, and I think to many of us in different ways of creating and expanding our vision and taking agency and caring about what we care about, and we are so thankful to you. Uh, Kent Fisher, you have been such an inspiration to many of us with your one credit mini course. You are just incredible, and we really, really appreciate everything you do for us. And this is what we got here when we came to the University of Michigan, and all of us that are here, and we're deeply thankful. Thank you so much. to introduce um, part of the performance and while the musicians and are getting ready, I'll talk briefly about one of the pieces, the, the second piece that we will perform with this ensemble. And it's called Resistencia and Resiliencia. Resistance and Resilience. Uh, it's a uh, work by my former teacher, Alfredo Rugeles, and was part of a uh, he, he won a, a prize to be in Bellagio, Italy, working on composition for this piece. And he decided to create a piece representing what was the protest in Venezuela in 2017. Um, there will be a lot of musical painting of the situation. And you, you will be able to hear the military boots just preparing to go against the students who were taking the streets to protest uh, against the government. You will hear some shots from guns against those students. You will listen some melodies that resemble that resilience of the people trying to recover from those hard moments and going back home just trying to keep their life going, although the, the, the social situation in Venezuela. So music as an expression, as a way to present or escape from the social reality. And that's part of what we, we are going to present in this part of the concert. And now I want to give the voice to Pamela to talk about the La Boca del Dragón. Thank you, Regalo, and thank you to all of our panelists uh, for your open-hearted descriptions of your own experience. The, the stories from individuals paint the picture and help us to understand more and more about Venezuela, the, the richness, the challenges, and also about your incredible agency and ambassadorship for Venezuela, so we're grateful. Uh, Marielva was going to describe La Boca del Dragón. I got to start working with her thanks to the Knight Wallace Fellowship. I, I just shout out here to Lynette Clemenson, who is the Wallace House Director and made this possible for us to meet at the Carillon. Uh, and I played some pieces that told stories from the Carillon, and Marielba approached me afterwards and said, in my country I can't tell certain stories, and I'm looking for alternative ways to tell these stories. Can we collaborate? And we started, we formed collaborative investigative composing, and she would tell me the stories, and I would document the stories and then start preparing music. And I'd ask her to play, even though she wasn't a musician, to play on the carillon the feelings and emotions that she was, was uh, feeling as she told these stories and remembering what was happening in her country. Uh, and that's how La Boca del Dragon was born. It was first a carillon piece. And then Regalo asked if I could uh, rewrite it for a, a chamber ensemble, which I did and worked more carefully again with Marielba 
And she, another alternative art form she has found to have as a solution for the journalism that she's committed to, but which is censored, is documentary poetry. So I will invite you in your program books to look at first at page uh, 25, and you will see all of the performers for this uh, program. We're joined now by Derek Weller on the double bass, um, Giancarlo Ureña on the percussion. We have um, Sandra, Sandra Jackson on the uh, clarinet and uh, Valeria de Luna Kent here as singer and narrator. Now Marielba's documentary poetry is written as a dialogue. And that you can find if you turn to page 27. And I recommend that we're hearing this piece first, La Boca del Dragon. It's the story, this term, La Boca del Dragon, was coined by colonizer Christopher Columbus. And it, when he was coming to the coastline of Venezuela and found this turbulent patch of water. And this is the, one of the places in Venezuela that people have tried to escape if they can't have uh, papers to leave the country. They hired these paneros, these small rickety boats, to escape from this area. But there's very turbulent water, so it's considered quite dangerous. In 2019, in the spring, two boats took off. The occupants of these boats were mostly young women. The boats disappeared and human trafficking is suspected. The parents of these young women went to the government to say, what's happening? Can you investigate this? Find my daughter. And in return, they started receiving anonymous threats. The parents did. So the government did nothing to address this. So Marielva started writing this poem. It's much longer than what's in the piece. But I can explain here that the, the phrases that are italicized are phrases that come from her journalistic research, and they've been documented. The phrases that are non-italicized are commentaries of the reality that's happening. You'll find that later on she'll say, mi pregunta es, multiple times, my question is, and she's asking why, how, where, all of these questions in the midst of the poetry. So we have the, the poetry being performed now because Marielba isn't here. Reinaldo so graciously agreed to, to become the narrator. And then the, the journalistic portions uh, performed here by Valeria. Um, we retained some of the Carolant set uh, or touch or sound, I guess we would say, um, in the concert with the tubular bells or chimes here. And every time you hear a chime struck, um, that is representing one of the person's lives of the, these missing people. And the, there are 60 missing people, so you will hear 60 different chimes throughout the piece. And with that, do you have something else? Okay, with that, yes. we're ready to begin uh, La Boca del Dragon. 